so the the first question that uh, the audience uh, is is uh, is asking is okay. So from the standpoint of uh, value, right? And so in the previous session we talked about uh, value based reimbursement, but in in this particular case with uh, the value proposition of ship and the intention uh, to uh, have a hybrid model of the especially on the on the company side of things the fee structure for the for the companies how they uh, how the the value proposition will be uh, put in front of them so that they get uh, more and more enticed to uh, become part of ship that's uh, that's question number one and then question number two for from the standpoint of um, the the uh, incentives of the incentives that can go beyond uh, uh, the the company and commercial stakeholders uh, like uh, uh, hospital networks and uh, service providers etc how they can also uh, potentially contribute to this uh, through um, in, in a financial way so uh, those two questions to begin with all right well i'll i'll take a stab at that i think you know it's we want to we were suggesting that the the consortium really needs to examine that value proposition for the the different participants in the ecosystem here to ensure that uh for the innovators that the the level of services and the uh the fees associated with that are um appropriate and and suitable and provide that option for innovators to come in at multiple phases of development through the uh through the process I think, again, looking at the value proposition for the hospital participants and ensuring that their participation in, in SHIP MD is, is driving value in, in, in their organization, uh, you know, by providing access to, to new and innovative uh, technologies, um, engaging their uh, clinical community uh, and their patient community um, in these, uh, these clinical trials. Um, and you know, I think then they, the question talks about service providers and, and payers. Um, I think we're we'll, looking at the payers first. You know, there we've discussed this in the reimbursement workshop. You know, I think there's the the value that Ship MD brings by working on the regulatory pathway to, to streamline that and harmonize that. There are examples and counterparts as we talked about the breakthrough pathway on the reimbursement side. Uh, is the recent um, CMS final rule on Medicare coverage uh, for innovative technologies, and we could envision a similar uh, type of structure for Medicaid for pediatric breakthrough devices. So I think that's certainly for the payers that you know Ship MD provides a, a different value proposition. So again, we were just suggesting that as part of the consortium's effort to fully develop that cons that strategic plan. And consider all the different stakeholders that are uh, participating here. Um, it would be important to look at the value proposition for each of them. So I welcome Chris, other panelists, to, to chime in there. Comment. Um, I think that one of the um, uh, the important pieces that that we've thought about, and we were talking about this in the navigation stream a little bit, is um, uh, this idea of, um, uh, I'm sorry, you're going to have to excuse me. I just totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> I'm going to pass the ball on to somebody else. Yeah, I mean, if, if you think about SHIP as you know, a bit of a control tower that's trying to organize incentives across the system, you know, there are a lot of different organizations that will have different viewpoints on what is valuable and what they feel appropriate contributing either directly or indirectly. You know, a lot of what we've covered today is more direct contributions where that cash in the door to ship to get it started is, is the nature of that. But certainly the indirect contributions that you know, the different stakeholders you mentioned will make um, certainly will be um, critical to success. So as you know, hospital systems and, and you know, the trial uh, you know, operators themselves, the investors, the payers, all of these folks will, in effect, have an operational role and operational relationship with the projects that SHIP is involved with as well. And so the question we've been mulling um, is how is that value proposition funded and how are the outcomes shared in a way that makes sense where 
incentives get aligned the right way and you start to get volume of projects through the through the system. That's the fundamental uh, question that I think the strategy process will need to address in a, in a very wholesale way. But, you know, I'll, I'll pass it to, to Pedro and others that you know, may have a different view from, a, from their perch um, on the clinical setting, et cetera. I'll come back to my point that I was trying to make. Um, one of the things that I think SHIP-MD can do is bring capital efficiency to this process. So an important thing is it does require some seeding from, again, as, as uh, Patrick and Chris mentioned, some uh, perhaps uh, foundations or others who are essentially seeding this with donations, grants, et cetera. That money can help establish the system that then provides what innovators cannot access on their own. Um, and at that point, once those pieces are in place, it becomes a highly capital efficient model for innovators and other participants because the, the infrastructure is in place to, uh, to make it cheaper to go out and, and engage with trials, to get this advice. It's a one-stop shop in many ways for, uh, for innovators they, where they would not be able to get this value anywhere else. At that point, it would, I, my, my hope is that this would be able to become a self-sustaining entity based on those fees because they can offer these services better and for less money than anybody else. And not that it has to be competitive with people or anything. Um, it is simply a, with the goal of accelerating more pediatric devices. John, I would add to that um, that with that efficiency that ShipMD could bring to this ecosystem, it becomes easier for other forms of capital to participate, whether it's venture funding that comes in uh, and has exposure to these types of innovation. It can be funding from other corporations that might be interested in this space. So I think SHIP MD will also have a role in helping make those connections for the innovators uh, and hopefully should be accelerating access to institutional capital. I think the other aspect of it is, is um, I think maybe Patrick, you mentioned that from the innovator standpoint, uh, you know, just the flexibility of being able to pick and choose what you need for that specific time point. You can do the value calculation yourself, or maybe with SHIP you can figure that out. You know, what, what, is, what is it you're saving in the way of time or, or um, um, risk mitigation? That, and what is that value to you? Having that flexibility to be able to participate in that kind of avocart fashion, I think is, is also a, a huge value uh, because often um, particularly if you if you're a small startup, you don't you you, you sort of have to you, you don't have a lot of options as far as uh, who's going to work with you. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I want to go back to something that that Patrick and Chris uh, clarified. And there's a, there's a, a comment from the audience that 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 was a good clarification that that you won't fund or invest in, in products, uh, which is a good thing. But then the question is, if, if you guys envision ship introducing those innovators. As, as part of that advisory capacity and, and to what the point that Terry just made to those uh, venture capital uh, opportunities that may align with their focus and, and, and the, the stage of risk that they're, that they're in at a particular time point? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there. Absolutely. I think that's, you know, we would hope that that would happen naturally to some extent, uh, that, you know, having that contract with ShipMD would you know spark interest from in, from investors? Uh, we certainly see the potential for ShipMD to be a direct facilitator of those types of of connections. You know, as this would be an an, an ecosystem, and we could invite uh, you know the the interest from the venture community and other investors. Uh, you know, they would be able to see those companies that participate in Ship, and you know, could drive some deal flow for them. Uh, you know, I think importantly for the innovators, they're getting, uh, you know, very critical advice on trial design and business planning and, you know, connections within the, the clinical community that could drive uptake. And all of those things matter uh, significantly for investors. And as they examine a, 
the proposition for investing in a company. Um, you know, again, having uh, that contract with SHIP or being uh, part of the SHIP ecosystem um, would definitely be helpful. Uh, so we see, we see that role for, for VCs, uh, you know, whether this evolves into some, you know, formal fund or, or, you know, group or membership for VCs, not sure. I think there could be opportunities for them to, to be part of the ecosystem and, and support these innovators. And, you know, we would have achieved, uh, in that case, the mission statement here to catalyze that investment. To be clear, I think what, just to add on to what Patrick uh, described there, um, the uh, ShipMD is not going to, nor it shouldn't, nor will it want to get into the role of capital raising. Um, that has some very different requirements. Uh, and, and so for innovations that come into the system, they should not expect that uh, uh, ShipMD is some sort of magical path to money. Um, that That's unlikely. But ShipMD can, and it's the community around it, can become great advocates for both the program uh, in general and for specific companies and be, be making sure that they're sharing information, knowing who those aligned investors are, getting uh, uh, summaries of uh, and, and updates in front of those people. I think there's a tremendous role there, uh, and I, I would love to see that come to be because I think that can – uh, make a huge difference uh, with individual companies and with the uh, the whole field. Yeah, I, I think as we looked at models um, and, and some that we flashed up on the slide, you know, many of those organizations and initiatives have you know demo days or kind of matchmaking events, convenings that you know provide kind of informal brokerage services for, for both sides, for, you know, for investors that are you know, interested in learning about, you know, projects that need funding, and of course, for the innovators to kind of step onto the shoulders of a larger platform and get access to those conversations and those those relationships. And so that seems to be a very core piece of the value that um, especially the innovators, I think, would, would avail themselves to in, in entering this process. Certainly, the more innovators can seek advice from ShipMD around, as Pedro said, business plans or thinking about um, reimbursement or how the market opportunity may be in front of them. Those additional things that can come from being in uh, a program, if you will, at ShipMD, I think make it easier for the messaging and the stories to be clear for investors. So I think Innovators can come in at different points in their process, but that value should be clear in that they have a, a good presentation, whether it's demo days or otherwise, to investors to track that kind of interest uh, with uh, hopefully technologies and business plans that are de-risked somewhat by participating with the SHIP MD services. Great. Now, I mean, that, that was, uh, that, those were really valuable insights. Now, related to that, there's uh, more questions from the audience that are kind of coalescing into, into several different categories. One has to do with the, with the specific details of the fee structure to the level that you can comment on that for the, for the innovators. And so the, if an innovator uh, is expected to pay a, a fee for an evaluation, or a fee for a quote, full membership of, uh, of of ship once they once they come on board. If you can comment on that as well. I mean, we looked at in the context of the value proposition conversation and ship's own operational sustainability. You know, what is realistic um, from an innovator's perspective around? you know, their ability and willingness to pay for these services and in and, and for what. And I, I think what we had sort of realized or done in a very preliminary market research uh, upon, which would need to be done again uh, in the strategy process, is that as it currently stands, there, there's probably low three-figure numbers of innovators out there that would be appropriate for what we've seen and heard across the various work streams as coming into ship uh, day one or, or year one. You know, each, each of those organizations 
Um, we'll be seeking capital and we'll be seeking advice. And there's already a market in place for people providing regulatory advice, business planning services, and those sorts of things. So what SHIP needs to offer, you know, must be competitive with what it's it's providing vis-a-vis those other service providers that are in the market, but also attuned to what the innovators can afford to pay. And, you know, I'll let my, my VC colleagues on the phone kind of opine on what, you know, use of funds is reasonable in these stage of companies. But um, from our vantage point, we didn't get to the, the stage of saying this is the right level for this type of service um, because I think there's still work to be done on, on you know, the scoping of what those services are. Maybe John or, or, or Terry, I'd, I'd be interested in, in your take on, on that as well. Yeah, I think that's right. The the that strategy phase, the consortium phase, is really where some of that uh, fee structure needs to be sorted out. I will say though that um, having an an entity like ShipMD, where a startup company can tighten its understanding of the regulatory requirements or have access to uh, the clinical community to refine uh, trial strategy, endpoints, et cetera, can be very valuable and can uh, help to uh, position the company well for perhaps venture capital uh, financing. And so I do think that for a, a, a young company getting up and running somewhere in this startup phase, that's a good use of uh, funding to seek those types of services because they do ultimately add value and help attract more funding, which is what we hope ShipMD can provide for innovation in this space. One of the things that uh, that I, I think about when I look at individual companies is that they all have unique needs. Each company is going to go out there and say, hey, we, we need to do, do our trials. We need to get a regulatory consultant. We need a reimbursement consultant. This will, you know, and we're going to get a budget for this. We're going to figure out what they each cost. We're going to get bids. We're going to engage people. So when ShipMD is thinking about how they are structuring their fees, that's going to be the comparison. What is the alternative in the marketplace, which absolutely exists. Um, it's just in lots of different places, and we're talking about putting it into one place. Do we need to be cheaper? Um, that would be great, but we don't necessarily have to be cheaper than uh, than what's out in the market if we can do it better by having it all in one place, being able to uh, accelerate the process, um, having the, the best people involved, all of that. But that will go into the thought process. The tricky thing is how do you standardize this so, in a way so that it doesn't become – a long drawn out negotiation every time a new company enters a ship or a new innovation enters the ship program um, because they're all going to be different. So how do you figure out how to standardize some of these based on particular needs and different uh, different innovations will require different size trials. They'll need a different number of sites. Some of them will need advice in one area, some of them another. It's going to take some work to get there. But you do want to try to figure out how to standardize that to the extent possible. One, one comment I would make, um, though, I, I think it's it's really important not to forget what SHIP is. So uh, it's unique. Um, there, there are no CROs that have uh, a, a network of hospitals, children's hospitals, as part of their infrastructure. Um, and, and so I think to compare ship to a CRO or, or something, or you know, try to make a, a value comparison, I, I think there, it's, it's, it's not possible, at least in my view, because th- that access to the clinical, um, you know, for, to, to the clinical substrate, if you will, to the patients, um, is really hard in pediatrics. That's the reason why often many companies just can't make it over the finish line. If they can't accrue enough patients or they can't identify the, the, the you know, a, a large enough group to be able to complete a clinical trial in a timely fashion. Those are, those are things that we are all very familiar with, with, uh, you know, failure stories of, of, uh, you know, 
really good ideas, good products that just never made it through. I think that's the value that the ship offers. It's unique. And I, don't, I think we should, you know, that should be emphasized. Uh, in, in whether, you know, whether you, what the monetary cost to that is, I, I, I think that that's, I think to your point, it, it, it ought to be standardized. I think you have to keep that, that, that value proposition in mind. Thank you, Pedro. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Because uh, I, I would also just add on there that, you know, ShipMD is unique in that it's a, a partnership with FDA and, you know, providing that uh, additional level of, of service and interaction with the FDA in, you know, in a streamlined way. Um, it's also, uh, you know, an effort to uh, shift the reimbursement landscape for pediatric devices as well and to improve that process. Uh, you know, again, I think these are, these certainly set ship apart from, you know, some of the apologies there, uh, from the existing service providers. It's, you know, and I, I think it's, um, we shouldn't look at ship, uh, at ship as a service provider. Uh, it's more than that. It's a broader ecosystem and, and policy play. Yeah, I, I really want to echo that, uh, that, that, that point of view because, uh, you know, they, from from the standpoint of of uh, running these kinds of uh, public private partnerships and, and uh, those kinds of collaborative efforts that involve the regulators and many relevant stakeholders, uh, they, that that's a key component of, of making sure that it's clear in the messaging and the value proposition that this is not just another option to uh, lower the cost of of CRO engagement because it's it's much bigger than that. And so, in 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 light of that. Uh, uh, there's another question that pertains to the, the understanding that, okay, yes, uh, innovators and, and uh, the device manufacturers will get value out of this, so hence they will be attracted to uh, pay the fee uh, for, for uh, helping things run. But then what about the other stakeholders that also get value out of this? Uh, and, for example, the, the, the payers is, is one, one example, and, the, and, and they also – the additional service providers, it, as they get value out of what SHIP is offering, any considerations about an additional either fee structure or financial component uh, to balance the value that they get with some of the some of the financial needs that the effort will will have. No, no takers for that to comment on that, Patrick. Sorry, could you repeat the question? I wasn't – what was the question exactly? Right. So the question is this. It is understood that uh, the innovators and the device manufacturers will get value out of their participation ship. And hence, the they, uh, understanding that there will be a fee structure for their participation because of the value that they get. But then what about the other stakeholders in the ecosystem that will also get value? And if there is a consideration to institute a fee structure for them as well, for example, yeah. the payers being one of it, et cetera. Okay, understood. Thank you, Klaus. So I appreciate you uh, clarifying there. I think, and that's again where we want we pose that question for the consortium to look at the value proposition. You know, look at, at hospitals. They they you know pay for uh, pay into the the management and running of these clinical trials alongside the innovators. And so there would be costs still for the hospitals to participate. And what is the value to them? You need to align that, um, you know, alignment of value for the, the other stakeholders participating. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I, but I, in terms of additional fee structures for those other participants, I think that's where we had looked at the funding sources coming more from um, you know, public grants and, and private and philanthropic foundations uh, to underpin this effort. Um, and I'll, yeah, I'll come on to one of the questions here that, you know, it's, it's talking about considering offering grants for participation for smaller companies in, in lieu of that, um, maybe future investment. I'm not sure if we want to go there, but you know, participation for, for the small companies to, to join in, there may be a way to offset some of the fees through grants or through NIH funding or through other sources to help these companies if it's a very early stage company. They may need to have some additional level of support to come into ship, and that that is all certainly a potential. Um, but what we've outlined here is a uh, 
a thesis that we need a strong underpinning of public and private grants to establish this entity and then, you know, an appropriate fee structure for the small companies that, you know, is, uh, you know, in line with the value that they receive and, you know, is in line with, as the, you know, the, the question states, you know, with the other participants in the ecosystem, ensuring that they're, you know, getting value out of their participation. I mean, I, I might just add that, I mean, I, I do think that that is a critical part of the strategy development process is looking across the different actors in the system that SHIP will interact with and doing a cost benefit or a cost effectiveness almost for them and thinking holistically about, you know, what they will be getting out of this relationship with, with SHIP. Um, you know, if, if I'm a hospital, um, you know, more effective outcomes, um, you know, reduce costs, over time, you know, re reduce other issues for them. It, it may be worth, you know, participating and investing in that. Similarly, payers, you know, downstream, you know, obviously, you know, with better outcomes come reduced costs for them, come more capital efficiency. And so you could make a case that they should be supporting that, that process in, in some fashion, you know, whether that's a membership fee, whether that's something they do on their own that links up to, to ship funding or the, the project level funding, I think that just bears, bears a strategic dialogue in the next phase of the, of the process to ensure you're not skewing the, the course of this in any, in any direction that's going to have unintended consequences. I got on this early in the process is, uh, the, and we may be providing value to hospitals and, and such, but we're also asking a lot of them early on. So my guess is at the outset here, we're just trying to ensure that we can get uh, the best partners on board. Um, I, I, w I suspect we'll end up being reluctant to start that relationship by asking for money from these people who we're asking to participate in the process. Um, that may evolve over time, but uh, and, and we do need to assess the value that we provide, and if it's if there is a real imbalance there, great. Let's uh, let's try to get some of that capital in. But looking at this right now, we're really, we're asking a lot of the community to make this happen, uh, and which is which is why I think some philanthropic support or government grants are probably necessary to get it going because we've got to convince people to get in. They're not necessarily banging that down the door to get into this uh, pro program uh, outside the innovators who probably would uh, be very excited to, to get into the program. Yeah, and so that, that yeah, th those were very valuable insights, uh, but they're related to that uh, aspect of, of uh, the, the future for SHIP and uh, the, it being its own uh, independent entity with all those considerations. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a question from the audience pertaining to the, the public tender side of things to select uh, who's going to uh, run ship. Any, any comments on any thought processes as to who would be doing the evaluation of that public tender and uh, any comment on the criteria to select uh, who's gonna be uh, driving the effort? Chris, would you like to take a stab at that one? Sure. Well, I think this, of course, would not be the first public health consortia that's been created, and I think we can look to, um, you know, models that are that are out there for running those those processes effectively. Um, you know, CPATH, for example, as 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 the operator of, of this, has um, you know been involved in, in a host of different. Um, tender processes um, for FDA funding, for NIH funding, and, you know, for foundation funding. You know, I, I think what we need to do as part of the summary report is look at what the most likely sources of funding are that are out there and attune this report to a process by which we can engage those funders and say, work with us to put together, um, you know, a call you know, on this initiative and, and, and put it out to the market to try and uh, attract some operational interests. We do have another few steps to take to figure out who the likely 
financial sponsors of this would be. And so I think that will also drive a bit of the, the public tender uh, or the tendering process in, in, in nature. Um, I think the point we were trying to make is because this is a system level view, it should be open um, and it should be competitive and it should you know entail that that you know that nature. It should not be a closed door um, closed door process. Great. And so, uh, Peter, I want to go back to a comment that you made uh, yesterday about the the, um, the perceived competition that there is uh, for patients to participate and the challenges that there are for patients to participate in trials. And you're seeing that kind of firsthand uh, in your own organization uh, and how to entice those those uh, those uh, players and stakeholders to also participate in it and get an additional value out of organizing, so to speak, the, the different efforts so that uh, there's an appropriate allocation of the, the different trials to the different uh, institutions and the, and the patient recruitment and all that uh, component, which is also critically important for the innovators that will get the value out of this. I think you can look at that issue from a couple of different perspectives. Uh, one is what would be the hospital. Um, I would imagine that there's a certain prestige level uh, that is afforded to a hospital that's involved, just like uh, hospitals that participate in fundamental research that's NIH funded, that carries a certain um, uh, level of recognition. I, I would think along those same lines, um, participation in, in this kind of an effort um, does carry that for a, uh, for a hospital. Above and beyond that, the, the, um, I, you know, the, 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 I always try to think in terms of, you know, what, what why would a, um, uh, why would the, the recipients of this, of this technology, you know, the patients or the parents, why would they want to participate? Well, often, particularly with rare diseases, the solutions aren't obvious. And, and, and often there, there's a, an understanding that, that, you know, that there's very little, out there that it's really going to directly help that particular disease or, or that particular child. And so being able to access an, a, a system that has been vetted, that has been reviewed, that has a lot of stakeholders looking at it, making sure that it's done properly, I think from the standpoint of the family member or, or, the, or the patient, that must give a certain level of comfort uh, that, that this is a well-designed uh, a well, well thought through process as best as it can be with new technology. Uh, so, I mean, to me, those are the, it's a different way of looking at, at, at addressing your question, but I think that there's, there's value propositions for everyone. Um, does that translate into easier recruitment and enrollment? I think it does. Um, I, I think it's, it's, uh, you know, in, in today's world, uh, if I'm a parent and I have a child with a rare problem, the first thing I do is I get on the Internet and I find out, okay, who's working on this? Who's got, who's publishing? Who's got new ideas? Um, it, it, it's, it, uh, if you know that there is a trial going on and it's at this particular series of institutions and one happens to be nearby, I think it's going to be, uh, make it easier to, to recruit those individuals. So I, I envision that this this will really have a, a lot of value for all of the stakeholders and and the ones that we you know we don't we don't think about because they're not necessarily participating in this are, are the actual recipients of the technology. I mean, at the end of the day, I think they're 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 the ones who have the biggest stake in this. Um, but I see a real benefit for them. Yeah, and, and Josh, you have worked on the on the both sides of the philanthropy and, and capital venture side of things. Uh, can you comment on where you see that that the back to better's uh, comment about the the recipients and the and the, the ultimate uh, beneficiaries of this, and how that can also uh, spearhead some of the discussions about the the public funding uh, that will be needed, at least certainly for the for the beginning uh, aspects of the of the collaboration. Um, yeah, I mean, look, this is a, an issue throughout uh, the pediatric space. Um, uh, there are challenges with so many potential solutions in terms of getting capital in. Um, there are, 
so, some some great things that have become very investable that are focused on on pediatrics, but there's still a lot of things that uh, just they're, they're not ready for that yet. And so philanthropy can play a big role. Um, the way I think a lot of both philanthropists these days, and and I think to a certain extent with uh, government uh, granting agencies. They're starting to think a little bit more about uh, how do we catalyze sustainable efforts. Uh, so it, it's not so much, look, let's just fund an operating budget every year with gifts that, you know, we've got to keep doing it again and again every single year. Um, what gets, what, what's starting to get people more excited these days is thinking about, okay, can we, we it's philanthropy, but can we seed an effort that then can stand on its own two feet? Uh, and I think that's a really important thing in the pediatric space where, yeah, in, in the philanthropic world, people are very open to, um, to supporting things around children, with children, children's health, various things. Um, it's, it, it, it's a pretty easy story to sell, actually. Um, but it gets hard to create sustainable um, initiatives on just the philanthropy alone. You have to figure out how to how to create revenue models and different things because the story does get old uh, with time. So I think there's a good th – this really strikes me as a great opportunity to show some folks who are interested in a variety of things, including children's health and um, uh, perhaps even things like entrepreneurship. There was a comment in there on the Calvin Foundation, such a great idea. Um, where, yeah, this can spur meaningful entrepreneurship. I love those ideas. And that's a really important area, I think, for us to focus in thinking about how we get this, uh, this initiative off the ground. Yeah, I'll, I'll just follow on there, John. I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right because I mean, the latest numbers that I've seen is that there's a little over a trillion dollars worth of philanthropic funds um, in the world right now, and they exist across 200,000 plus different foundations, 90% uh, of which manage less than, than $10 million. And so they're going to be looking for efficiency, place to put their money where they know it's going to be well taken care of and have an outcome that they couldn't do on their own. And so because this is a system level initiative, in some respects it's hard, but in other respects it really offers the opportunity to draw people together in a way that certain other things do not, that are maybe disease focused or more place based in, in, in nature. So I think it's it's an opportune time to be thinking about philanthropy and, and where to take this. I agree. Yeah, and that I think that's that that really connects the the, the public private partnership uh aspect of, of what you guys uh, laid out in the in the in the roadmap. So that's uh that's definitely something that that uh we need to take note of and, and ensure that that gets captured in the in the blueprint for uh, the next stages of the of the evolution of the partnership. And so, connecting that that philanthropy with that uh, venture capital uh, notion is is important. But, but also, uh, just as Ed Terry, the point you made about uh, ship providing that matchmaking between innovators and and venture capital. I, I what's your thought on also providing that connectivity between venture capital and the and the, the nonprofit philanthropy uh, arm of things and triangulate between the innovator the the philanthropy side of things and the and the uh, venture capital yeah thanks Klaus I think it's a critical point uh, philanthropy plays a large role Chris I liked your comment about um, philanthropy for a whole ecosystem um, perhaps versus disease specific philanthropy I think ship MD does offer uh, the opportunity to think about pediatric device innovation as a whole, as a place where philanthropic dollars can go to see the entire um, system move forward and to accelerate and to de-risk some of these uh, great innovative ideas. So it probably will be um, an interesting opportunity for ShipMD to build relationships with those philanthropic organizations as well as the venture capital funds. Uh, because it becomes an easier place for those dollars to go when it's organized in a way that 
those groups can look at multiple companies. They can see progress across different disease states, across different platforms, and they can see uh, an entire ecosystem working together. So I think it's a it's a great consideration for SHIP-MD and for the strategic planning process. Can I add a point on that? Um, one, of the, one of the things that I think is important here is that we talk about bringing in multiple funders um, to complement the fact that we've got multiple stakeholders. Uh, yeah, they, I, we've had discussions at different points around, well, you, you could have you know, one group, essentially, whether a, an investment firm or one foundation come in and fund this whole effort, and it becomes streamlined. Uh, it, you know, you've got just management efficiencies, and you just sort of move forward. I think that the idea of having multiple funders alongside multiple stakeholders is pretty important, especially if you're going to be involved with uh, engagement with the FDA, with CMS, other government groups, having transparency around uh, what's happening is easier when you have multiple folks involved. You can set up governance systems that can be more objective. And I think that's going to be really important as part of this process so that we don't end up with favoritism. We've got something that at least um, is showing great effort towards being towards equity among different innovations that are hitting different where it's all children, but perhaps hitting different populations. Uh, and having this governance and transparency is going to be absolutely vital. So having funders that support that vision will be critical. Absolutely. And uh, Patrick, I'm going to uh, put you on the spot a little bit, if, you, if I may, just from the standpoint of, of building on that on that concept. Uh, one thing that I, I, and this is my very personal observation, um, I, I see those uh, those philanthropy uh, activities and those charities and those patient groups. They're not really care about their, their patient communities, uh, and that when they when they have dollars that they can use to fund activities, uh, there's a tendency to, tendency to fund uh, research that. Uh, is very exciting for publications and, and those kinds of things, but doesn't necessarily move the needle in impacting the lives directly of the of the patient community. So, uh, from your standpoint, as some, somebody that, that handles the, the the you know the, the manufacturer side of things and the innovation side of things in an industrial kind of way, uh, as a conglomerate of those of those uh, companies, how how you see that additional connection. To also potentially one day transform that that mindset of in the in the, in the you know charity community to ensure that they they have a seat at the table to really move the needle forward and impact you know very tangible in a short amount of uh, span of time uh, the impact of the of the lives of the of the patients that they they care for. Yeah, absolutely, Claus. I think it's a good point. You could uh, certainly imagine um, ShipMD and participation in ShipMD by an innovator allowing them to bring in a different set of, of investors in their company at different stages, whereas before they may not have been as comfortable. Um, and those venture uh, philanthropists may have been looking at more of funding some of the academic research as opposed to some of the more uh, product development and commercialization aspects of this. Uh, and, you know, with a, an ecosystem and this pathway through SHIP for innovators, you, uh, you know, I think that is uh, – you know, certainly the potential to bring in a, a more diverse set of funders. Um, and I think that's, you know, SHIP will, you know, be able to provide that mechanism to allow investors, a variety of investors, um, to look at that deal flow, if you will, of those innovators moving through SHIP and their products and, and understanding uh, with more confidence that they would be uh, progressing through regulatory approval, uh, securing you know, reimbursement status, uh, you know, having great connections within the hospital networks already, um, you know, all those things would inspire confidence in, in investors. Um, so I think that's, you know, certainly that potential to bring in a more diverse set and for SHIP to play a role in, in um, you know, facilitating some of those introductions or interactions. Yep, absolutely. And and Pedro, since you have the vantage point of, of the you know from the academic medicine standpoint, and you and you see the both sides of the fence, 
Uh, is it not also a potential to also uh, have the, the academic research side of things become more competitive because you can have some of the some of the more basic research type uh, things translating into uh, tangible things that, that become uh, an actual solution uh, to patients' lives. So you see that as a, as a potential component as well of the of the value proposition for that side of the of the stakeholder equation. Oh, absolutely. I, I think that you know a lot of the research work that's done, whether it's at a at a medical school or, or at a hospital, tends to be in the biotech, and and usually that's not difficult to get if it truly is valuable. It's not difficult to get it out. The the medical device uh, development, however, is quite different, and that's much more challenging. Um, and and even um, uh, even having uh, to interact with uh, with the tech transfer office, we're not accustomed to working with medical uh, device uh, deals or, or arrangements. All those are, are are important challenges. So I think having uh, for, certainly for the for the inventor uh, in an academic uh, setting, um, that you know the interaction with SHIP um, is it would be extremely helpful. Having said that, I, often what happens now is is that the uh, inventor interacts with a pediatric consortium, um, and uh, if there is one nearby, that's the easiest way. Unfortunately, there's only a limited number of those, and and getting access and 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 getting on that radar scheme can be very can be very challenging. Um, but uh, yes, absolutely, I think the medical device development from from concept to uh, translation uh, it presents a different challenge than than the biotech. Um, Developments. Yeah, exactly. No, that's that's great. And I want to take a, a moment as we are uh, hitting the the ten minute mark uh, to thank the the audience for the for the activity, engagement, and and uh, contributions. I uh, just m want to make a plug that if you uh, want to roll up your sleeves and want to actively participate in this, uh, do reach out to us, and and we'll make sure that uh, you get included in the conversation moving forward, because I see a, a lot of uh, really cool suggestions, as, as John mentioned, some of the some of the funding ideas, and there's there's more coming in. So uh, thank you for that. Okay, I want to uh, take a bit of a pause here and uh, go through each one of you in the panel and uh, have you uh, make your, your uh, concluding comments before we close the, the session. Chris, do you want to take uh, first stop? Sure. Um, well, I, mean, I think this has been a really productive discussion, and, and I think um, just indicates you know, the level of complexity um, of an initiative that is ambitious and how thoughtful we need to be about the strategy process moving forward. Um, you know, this group on the line here today and under CPAS guidance has been uh, thinking about this uh, in some cases for multiple years, and in our case for a little over a year. And as you can see, we've got the contours of the types of issues that need to be thought through, but are, are, are very much in need of, uh, of support from the community to get involved to make this a reality um, and, and kind of take the, the motivation um, into, into execution. So I'm just very pleased by the, uh, the support that we've had and, and the, the feedback we've gotten today. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Klaus. Thank you. Patrick, do you want to go next? Yeah, certainly. No, I'd echo everything that Chris has said. It's been very valuable and some, some great contributions uh, and questions uh, from the audience. So we certainly appreciate that. Um, you know, it's, it's particularly helpful at this point as we, we are in this pre-consortium phase and as we, you know, bank these questions and considerations uh, for that strategic planning process, um, this type of input is, is uh, critical. So it's been a very valuable session. Excellent. Uh, John, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really excited here. I, I think there's a great opportunity to at least move this forward to the next stage. And we don't have to do everything all at once. We do need to try to figure out how things would, uh, how this would look from a general perspective and come up with this good narrative. Uh, but really, the next step is to fund this consortium and get that going so that they can answer a lot of these really excellent questions that have been posed here that yeah, we haven't been able to quite figure out yet. We know those answers are out there, but we're, it, it involves more work. It involves 
uh, a, a dedicated team starting to roll up their sleeves and really hammer these things out, starting to do interviews, doing different things. So, I, you know, my hope is that we can get enough of a narrative around this that we can put together, get the funding uh, together to put together a, um, the next, the, the real consortium, not the pre-consortium. Uh, and at that point, yeah, this thing starts to get a real life of its own. Uh, so I'm optimistic that we'll get there. I'm excited to see it unfold, and it, it's really been a pleasure being involved with it. Excellent. Andrew, do you want to go next? Uh, sure. I, I, as the uh, as the clinician in this, um, to me, this is extremely important. Uh, it's a way to for for the inventor to contribute to to um, to the uh, the you know development of solutions for children. Um, but I think the other aspect of this is that the goal of this of this session and the goal of this whole conference is to solicit feedback. I think in that sense, this has been extremely successful. I think just looking at the interaction uh, amongst not only the panelists but also the 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 the, uh, the comments um, that are coming in, uh, I, I, I think uh, we have done our job and, and we've done it well. And I and I think I congratulate everybody for all the work uh, that's gone on into this. Excellent. Terry, you get the last word. Uh, a, a lot of great comments from uh, my fellow uh, panelists. Um, I think this is a really important initiative. I think it's critical that we find ways to accelerate innovation in pediatrics. I would echo John's comments that I think it's important that we move to the consortium phase and we really flesh out a lot of these uh, questions. and. I would just say thank you to the audience in particular. Some great comments, questions, and suggestions have come in. So um, it's wonderful to see people engaged. And um, thank you to the whole team for uh, all the efforts uh, to get us to this point. Excellent. Okay, so with that, uh, I think we can go ahead and close the session. Thank you, uh, Chris, Patrick, Terry, Pedro, John. This was, this was great.